Oh, hello everyone. Well, someone, someone told me that I was wearing the same outfit, you know, <laughs> that I wear almost the same outfit in uh, all my videos. Uh, this wasn't someone on YouTube, so don't take offense of that, you know. And I did, I did not take offense of it, but I rather found it funny. I later found it funny. And um, my joking nature says, hey, I have seen Super Mario in the same red and blue overall. You know, he's, he's worn the same outfit for, for over 30, 40 years, you know. And <laughs> just think of me as a Super Mario or, or a Mickey Mouse, you know, because they look the same. Anyways, uh, getting getting straight to um to the video. Someone wrote in the comments. They requested that hey, Mark, can you talk about alcohol and drugs and fornication in in church? And this is what I'm here to, to talk about right now. I've done videos about alcohol and drugs before, you know, my testimony. But this time, let me go a little deeper. Let me go a little deeper about alcohol and drugs. Sorry, it's a little, it's, it's cold this side. It's, it's really cold this side. So if I sip on something hot, please don't feel offended. Don't be offended. Now, alcohol and drugs. We have known alcohol and drugs to be hallucinogens, mostly drugs. Alcohol has many types. These spirits. You know the vodka the vodka family and um, there's beer and these are uh, um, tizers I think like grip tizers appetizers or you know ciders Yeah, things like that. Things that have an uh, alcoholic content. There's, um, there's a sanitizer. <laughs> These people that have drunk sanitizer during lockdowns because, you know, there was a lot of, um, uh, for the first weeks of, um, of lockdown, some people have, some people drank sanitizer. You know, that was very, very alcoholic. And uh, what is it called? Methane, I think. People use a lot of stuff anyways, guys. But this is one of the reasons why people use... I'm going to start in the family of alcohol before I go to drugs. Alcohol should never be a problem. Because they, there's also... I've actually seen um, videos of people that say, I do not drink alcohol, I drink wine. Well, wi wine is also alcohol. In a sense, it is alcohol. Because it, it has, you know, an alcoholic uh, component to it. You know? Anything that is uh, distilled has alcohol in it but anyways this is what i know about alcohol sometimes people take alcohol to celebrate and that's uh the main custom of it you know you go to a wedding 
there's a lot of booze people drink they 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 are happy they chill and they're all good you know it's it's a uh, it's someone's birthday um i mean when you're celebrating really you know but some people take it beyond celebration like every day they go to the bar if they do not go to the bar they come home and they have a drink and they're like i do not go to the bar i drink from home you know and they do it they partake daily but now let's look at the reasons let's let us investigate some of the reasons why people drink people drink usually to forget apparently to burn the steam off you know to ease the pain to ease the pressure people drink to celebrate some people really drink out of peer pressure that someone comes and says hey come and join us we're going out for a drink and you're like nah uh, drink is not my kind of thing when they tell you come on be a man men are supposed to drink and you go in you drink you end up drinking things you can't handle next thing you know you are throwing up in front of every one even in front of kids that you're supposed to be an example to you throw up in front of everyone that had that even had respect for you and for the most part some people throw up they get so drunk they forget what happened in that night now that which we call drunkenness can happen in any of the mentioned occasions of drinking when you have peer pressure when you're celebrating and when you're just out having fun you know some people even get drunk in their own house and he's alone in the house drinks gets uh, <laughs> totally drunk and he's like yeah as long as I'm in my house that's fine you know but the thing is the drink is not supposed to control man man is supposed to control the drink but where the big question might come is who has control over the drink because many people say i i am I'm, I'm i'm good i'm good i'm good you know i can drink can drink this amount of booze and or liquor and i'm good but you see the effects of alcohol or drunkenness they eventually catch up with you have you met people that speak with a heavy tongue like i've 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 that that because they drink too much I have met them. There's also people that have lost a uh, track of reality, you know, it numbs your senses and you're something else. Al- alcohol really disables you. I'm telling you, it is a matter of time. It can either make you bitter or make you numb or dumb it does that it affects people differently and let me share something with you these things you receive they are spirits now something people do not know about alcohol is that alcohol in its sense is not a bad thing but who offers you the alcohol Mo- 
most of these brands that create the alcohol that most people drink they dedicate these drinks they cast these drinks they want to make you poor they want to make you dumb they want to disable you they want to impair you that is their goal they literally cast you and yet you're buying their drinks I want you to get your, your strongest drink, your best drink, and read the slogan. Usually read the slogans of these, on, these, on these beers, of these brands. There's one I know. It's like Moonshine. From, from back at home. And they have a slogan that it says... They have a slogan that says, the spirit that binds us. That is a very subliminal slogan because someone might say that spirit, a spirit that binds us, that brings us together. And that's what they say when they, that's what they mean. You know, they try to explain to the masses when they're like, what does your slogan mean? Ah, it's a spirit that binds us, brings us together. That is not what it means. To bind is to tie in one place, is to hold in one place. And they call it a spirit. Well, they might tell you that all oh, their spirits, 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 that they're called spirits. They say the spirit that binds us. That is the spirit that captures you. And everyone that drinks that drink, back at home where i come from eventually they, they are destroyed they become poor they lose their work they become drunkards they get captured in there i'm telling you i haven't gone yet i haven't gone far yet because i haven't pulled out scriptures and i'm going to share scriptures no one will tell you that, hey, I drink, but I drink a little, and it doesn't harm. You know? But I think now is the time I start sharing some scriptures. I think, let me start with, um, with John chapter 2. Let's start with John chapter 2. John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine. Now, many people use this scripture to um, justify the drinking and everything. And I want to tell you my, my, my stand. And my stand shouldn't be your stand. You decide for yourself. I used to drink, and I never had a problem with it. Even until some journey. In my in my Christianity, not far not far long ago, by the way, not far long ago, but I never really used to partake so so much or often, you know. I wasn't a kind of guy, but where drink was, it was offered. I would drink, but I reached a time and just decided not to, just for me. And to drink is not a problem. Let me share this first. Jesus turns water into wine. And the third day, there was, a, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three 
coffins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with, with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have, uh, have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now we can observe in this portion of scripture the circumstances in which Christ performed the miracle of wine. First, it was a wedding. And second, it was, it was a wedding and there was a big guest. And the main one, he was invited, him and the disciples, they were invited. But now, if you really look at this, how more could Christ, what miracle could have been performed more to capture these people? Because miracles capture people's attention. It is like reeling in people. You reel them in, you know? And it was the first miracle he performed. Now, many might say, oh, he was a drunkard, he did this and that. But the truth is, you can see the situation. He doesn't tell us that he drank from it. But it's the, the, the governor that drank from it. And he prays that, hey, besides, he didn't even know, but he tasted the wine. It was very, very good wine. What I'm getting up uh, to is that he performed the miracle and many to this day use that as a, a strong point to, uh, to hold the drink. But later on we see that even at the Last Supper he drank wine and ate bread with his disciples. And one needs to understand the wine they used to drink from vines. You understand? It wasn't beer or it wasn't vodka. It was wine. Now, this is me sharing what I do understand when I read this and when I see the life of Christ. To drink wine is not, a, is not a problem, it is not a sin. In fact, it is not even mentioned anywhere in the Bible that wine, when you drink um, a glass of wine, you are a sinner. But let me show you a perspective. Earlier I shared about the reasons why people drink. To drown their sorrows. We've always heard, we, we, we've heard the, um, the saying, uh, draining your sorrows in the bottle. If you are the kind that drains your sorrows in the bottle, my friend, you're a sinner. Why do I say that? Because if you read in Deuteronomy 28, the book of Deuteronomy 20, chapter 28, about... In the, in the commandments that the commandments that God gave
Wait, 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 wait. Mm, uh, 27. Sorry, sorry. Hmm. Twenty eight, curses of the Lord. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 from 58. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou may fear the, this the glorious and fearful name of the Lord thy God, the Lord will bring all these plagues. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the, and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long uh, continuance, and yeah and um sorry about that i'd finish that and um i'm looking for the part of um mm, okay i think let me go to deuteronomy 5. i thought it was in Eight. Um, I thought it was in 28, but let me read from, from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, that's chapter uh, 5 verse 6, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image or any likeliness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So, the first commandment is, is about never worshipping other gods. And let me tell you something. If you drain your sorrows in alcohol, you are worshipping that drink. You have given it power over you. Or if, if even if you, you smoke a blunt, or you do crack, you do heroin, you do anything, opium anything even even um when it comes to medication and you give medication you know, you know that that power over you you could even be a therapist you could even be your pastor once you you look at this drug or person as or entity as your source of hope you are worshiping it so if you go to the bar or you go to drink to drain your sorrows, you smoke a blunt to find peace, you smoke a blunt, a blunt to forget your sorrows, you smoke a blunt to find inspiration, you're worshipping that drug. And you're worshipping the God behind that drug. You're worshipping that demon behind that drug. Now this is when it's going to get. This is when it starts getting serious, because many people do not know that they do this. They do not realize it. When I was getting off these drugs, God was teaching me this, and I'm here to share. Um, I've shared about the Last Supper. I've shared about John, and I'm going to share about. 
the book of Psalms. We are going to um, uh, sorry, the Proverbs, the twenty eighth proverb, the thirty thirty first, the thirty first proverb. We're going to see. Cause let me tell you something. I asked God about drinking. And let me tell you where he led me. This is where he led me. Because I sat down within my mind. I was a Christian. I thought, hey, drinking can't surely be wrong, you know, because everyone is preaching about this drinking. If I drink and I don't hurt anyone, then I'm not sinning, you know? And so many people have that that kind of thinking that, hey, when, when I drink, I drink from home. I don't hurt anyone. Let me tell you something. My wife told me, I never want you to drink. She told me that. I never want you to drink. I do not like the smell of alcohol. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you when she said that. That's when God opened my mind. And let me tell you something. If you're married and, and your partner tells you, I don't want you to drink, I don't want you to smoke, and you go do it, you are going to get beat, I'm telling you. You are going to get a beating. And it's not a physical beating, but you're going to get a beating. Because now you're hurting your, your partner. They've told you, hey. And let me tell you something. I want you to see one thing. Most times, people that drink so much, they end up spending their money, hard and money, on the drinks, and they can't go back. They can't spend a coin on their children. But when it comes to the drink, they'll spend that money. They'll call their friends like, ah, my, 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 my friend, my friend, my friend, come on, come on. Today is on me. All the drinks are on me. In fact, if, if they're in a bar, they can, uh, sorry, in a club, they can, they can get so excited. They go grab the mic from the DJ. They're like, hey, DJ, this is an open night. Free drinks for the whole house. Ay, 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 I'm telling you. Everyone just goes drinks. It's after. It's after. They bring the bill. That's when it dawns on them. They're like, oh, Lord, why am I this stupid? Why am I this crazy? You can find the guy that makes it rain in the bar, but you go where they, they live. They live in misery, I'm telling you. Because that's a spirit, you know, of, of a, a, a canker worm. So, so that you do not grow, you do not, it takes away everything you have. You can never invest in anything solid. I'm telling you. And let me tell you, so many drunkards, people that, that, um, oh, okay, sorry for that. But so many people that struggle with drinking, find these people have blessings of of income, they have blessings of, uh, they have this favor of re of receiving, you know, like everything they touch becomes gold, but in an instant, it all gets wasted in a bar, and they go back to square zero, they're like, oh my God, I had this money, I wish I had done that. That is when you know now you're dealing with a spirit, you're no longer drinking, you're dealing with a drink, you're dealing with a spirit behind the drink. The book of Proverbs, chapter 31, Lemuel's lesson. I want to read from verse 1 to 7. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother told him. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings or Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto them that is ready, unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty 
and remember his misery no more. Read that proverb from verse 1 to 7 and tell me if you really want to grow like you see that man of God that you see that you admire so much that person who serves God a person who has knowledge of God that you look at and like oh my god I wish I wish I get there I wish I experienced that that has sacrificed not to do these things I'm telling you when I read that his mother told him it is not for kings to drink wine or strong drink right because they will forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted if you want to be a leader if you want to grow and ascend you know from the normal from the ordinary you have to make sacrifices you're not going to partake in things that everyone does, you know. You have to, to live a, a life apart from, uh, from the rest. You can't be seen in a bar. You're a leader. You can't be seen in a bar drinking and chilling and speaking nonsense with people, you know. Because that's what happens most times. It is very hard to find people drinking. And they're like, hey, uh, I read this Bible verse yesterday and it was amazing. No, they hardly do that. These are the stories they talk about in bars. Hey, I got a woman pregnant. I don't want my wife to find out. Hey, I think I got the HIV. Hey, I lost my job. Hey, those are the kinds of stories you find in bars. Or hey, did you see what we did to this team yesterday or on, 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 on Sunday or on Saturday? Ah, we destroyed them. Yay, hippie hooray. You know, those are the kind of stories you find. You can never find stories like, hey, the Lord revealed this to me yesterday. It was quite profound and I saw the rapture and or this or that or that. You can never find such stories amongst people that are drinking. No, it is always worldly. Now, he keep, he says that, he says, Give drink, uh, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Now, guys, I want to tell you that verse 6 and 7, that is a drunkard's reward, I'm telling you. No drunkard has peace. They always lack money. They'll get money for the drink, but they will never have money for rent. They're always, you know, at loggerheads with the with their landlord. He's always chasing them. They're always losing stuff. They keep selling stuff from their house, you know. And this applies also on drugs, you know. It's that is what it does. He clearly says that hey, give strong drink to him that is ready to perish. Go and drink. If you're ready to perish go and drink if you have a heavy heart because that those the, these are the spirits that are going to come the spirit of death that is what follows alcohol death heaviness and what's the other one poverty or lack and the the, the fourth is um misery and you know what they say about misery misery loves company you know so that's why misery finds company in the bar because there's more misery there now these are the four things that follow you death heaviness poverty and misery now we have seen this happen before with celebrities that you find a celebrity overdosed on a drug celebrity had drunk drunk issues you, you know um alcohol alcohol issues they were abusing alcohol or drugs and they committed suicide I many celebrities have ended up that way because they had these spirits they had the spirit of death tormenting them they had heaviness you know they had 
lack of poverty, knocking at their door, always whispering that, hey, we're coming for you, you know, and misery. These are the spirits that are going to get you. you. You can become a drunkard. You can start becoming a drunkard when you have a proper life, when you have a family, when you are responsible. You could even have been a pastor. But if you become a drunkard, this spirit is going to follow you. And people will see your end, your demise. You'll be like, oh my God, that guy used to be a pastor. But see what happened to him. This guy used to be a good man five years ago. But look at his life now. He committed suicide. That's, and when people die, that's when the whole story comes out. Like you start hearing that, hey, yeah, man, he, 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 was, he was struggling with debt. He was miserable. I mean, you could see it. You know, they start talking about the person's last days. That, ah, this guy was miserable, man. The past three years, they weren't good for him. He always, he always had a heavy heart, you know. And if you're married now, these things are going to bring in divorce. People are going to get tired of you because you're always destroying. You're always taking. You're always taking. You can't stay with your husband or wife. You can't stay with your spouse when, you, when you're wasting money like this. They're going to look for an exit. It takes a patient partner or a, a, a Christian, a true Christian, to be patient and pray for this and fight this for you. You know? But how many real Christians are out there Anytime you see a marriage that breaks because of alcoholism, drunkenness, then you know there was never true Christianity in their home. Because if there were really serious Christians, the other spouse should have stood in and fought for the, for the other. But from the beginning, it was never there. There was no presence of God in that marriage. Because where God is, he would destroy this. He would destroy the spirit. Now, <clears throat> giving you that, Tell me if you still want to drink alcohol. This video is getting really long. It's 37 minutes now. But. And I, I haven't touched the, the part of drugs yet. It's where I'm heading. Now about drugs. About drugs. Let me read you a chapter in the book of John. Chapter 10. But before I read that. Let me first say something about drugs. I did, I did drugs, I did, I did cannabis, I did marijuana. I did it for a, for, for, for a long time. I know the effects of it. First of all, drugs, they affect how you look. They spoil your teeth. I'm telling you, my teeth were destroyed. They just recovered. This is just recovered, you know? My teeth were brown, man. I'm telling you, they were brown. You couldn't smile. Someone cracks a joke and you're like, <laughs> you know, or you're like, <laughs> you know. But now I can smile, I can show my teeth. They're not perfect, but they are far better than, you know. They destroy your health. Your health. Same as alcohol. Destroys your health. Destroys your look, your appearance, you know. Drugs destroy you completely. Now today you can see people even identify, they see, you find people that smoke weed. Look at my lips. They're not black anymore. I don't know if you can see that. I don't have black lips anymore. They used to be black. You could tell that all oh, this person used to smoke, I'm telling you. I look like a zombie walking around with black lips. I'm skinny like... Like that, it used to be like that, you know, it used to be funny looking. I remember I used to, I used to see, I used to find my mom sometimes crying, find her crying and she'd ask her, hey mommy, why, why are you crying? And she's like, Mark, look at what you have done to your life. Look at how you look. Is this how you repay me? You know, it's so sad, you know, that you, you, you cause someone else pain. <laughs> These are the things that taught me that, hey, the life we have is not our life. If you cause someone else pain, then just know it's not your life. If you can cause someone else pain in this life, just know this life is not yours. We are meant to live this life for others, not for, not for us, you know? So the thing is, drugs destroy. 
and that's the physical bit of it drugs it is actually said scientifically that hey it's proven that drugs destroy your memory they start messing with your memory they mess with your health they mess with your lungs you know you smoke it messes with your lungs now I want to go to the spiritual bit of it I've shared about my experience in the drugs but now I'm not going to go into that it's been said that all oh, weed is a gate is, is, is a is a gate is a gate to the spirit it is true drugs the only the, 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 the only way one is supposed to access the spiritual realm is by God or through God when he sends you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gives you a vision he speaks to you he shows you things that is the only way we are meant to know things of the spirit but today people use so many things to access the spiritual realm and drugs is one of the quickest and easiest ways to do that I remember I saw a guy uh, I've always met you know a lonely guy he lost he, he lost his mind you know back at home I used to meet him on the streets in the neighborhood and God told me that that guy what you people call mad it is not madness someone gets lost in the spirit that they can no longer tell the difference between what is real and what's not real they can no longer differentiate the spiritual world and the physical world they see both both merged and this guy he was walking around i remember i passed him and he walked around and he was standing next to a bicycle the bicycle called him and he went and he's like huh? what have you said and the bicycle spoke to him and the lord immediately told me that this this there's a demon in the bicycle it is calling him and he thinks it's the bicycle speaking to him and it ran back to me you know he revealed to me this is where all your entertainment comes from the animations where you find a book where you find a piece of, of serviette or tissue speaking you can find a cup it starts speaking to you you know that is when the spirits are manipulating stuff you know around you, the environment around you demons can speak through a phone they can speak through a laptop they can speak through a book they can speak they, you can see this book and it starts speaking and you see eyes on it and you know but that's how demons mess with people and in that state that's when someone someone can eat from a trench you can pour trash and someone goes and gets food from a trench or a, or a bin a trash <laughs> from the trash imagine vomit or throw up or anything disgusting and that person can go and see it and see it like a very nice plate of mac and cheese i'm telling you or they can see a sandwich Someone can go and see very dirty water or urine and they are seeing a glass of clean water and that's what the demons are showing them so all these people that get all these issues that they look they lose touch of reality it is spirits messing with them people that are taken to uh uh psych words you know they take you to rehab they say this person is a, is a psychopath they have they, they have lost their way they, they don't even know what reality is they've lost touch with reality these people are supposed to pray for them but people are taken to mental hospitals mental health all these campaigns spending and wasting millions of money on on demonic stuff you know and this is what satan wants and this is what his children that work for him uh, are, are chasing after to destroy men this way See, Satan doesn't want people to know that he exists. He doesn't want people to know that God exists, that God is real, that God has power. Yet God has power. Now, I want to read John 10, uh, verse 1. <clears throat> the book of John, Jesus is the good shepherd. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. People who do drugs, this is what they do. That the gate to the spiritual realm is the Holy Spirit. But these people have used different stuff. And I'm telling you guys, these rituals people perform to have access to these demons, to open up the, whatever they call it, the third eye, to see in the spirit. That is what Christ, Christ is telling you that, that they are jumping. They are thieves, they are robbers. They're jumping over, over the fence. That is cheating. And let me tell you something. If you take a drug and you go into this trance or you open your third eye, that is a very dangerous thing. Because you have, you're in the spiritual realm full of billions of demons with no protection. Any spirit is going to deceive you. Any spirit can come and deceive you. But if it is the Holy Spirit that has taken you into the spiritual realm, you're going to be under his protection. No one is going to touch you. No demon can even come close to you if he does not want that. You, 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 you will hear people talk about gates, gates, gates of opening the spiritual, gates opening the spiritual, that drugs, drugs are gateways into the spirit. And when you take a drug and you enter the spirit, you are a thief and a robber because you're not passing through the gate, the main gate, which is the Holy Spirit. But he says that he that uses the gate, the same is the shepherd. Them that patiently wait on the guide of the, of the on the guide of the Holy Spirit. They are the shepherds. Now, anyone that takes drugs will justify what they do. That they have seen this and they've seen that. People will see these are the people that will tell you that they have seen. Um, aliens have appeared to them, they have seen Christ, but they, they even see sometimes, sometimes the spirit masquerades and deceives them, anything. Drugs and alcohol, that, that, that is a different, that is a whole different story, guys. A whole different story. People use drugs to worship. And people have no idea of that, you know, even cigarettes. You see, the thing is, to enter the spiritual realm, you just have to heighten the sense of man to a certain degree. And then you just open up into the spirit. These people have messed with human, <laughs> with the human body and they know what they are doing. These scientists, they know. And these spiritualists, they know this because these, these demons, they meet, they worship, they tell them this stuff that, hey, go use marijuana, legalize it, do this and that and that, make it free so that everyone uses it and they all become dumb. You know, but let me tell you something. And if, and if you have someone, you know, that is using drugs and they glorify it, the only thing you can do is pray. You can never preach to them and they get you. People that use drugs argue a lot. They think they know everything. Because you're not dealing with a, with a, with a human, you're dealing with a spirit. The only thing you can do is pray for them, rebuke that demon. I'm telling you, you can cut them off. Let's say you have a child or a friend, a family member that that is addicted. They keep stealing from, 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 from the house. They keep, they, they, they keep draining you. Let me tell you, chasing them away is not the solution. Taking them to rehab is not the solution. Praying for them is the solution. Engaging them is the solution. Engage them in the word of God. Because you see, a person that does drugs is someone that is seeking answers. Is someone that is seeking knowledge. 
but they're just in the wrong place. And let me tell you, most druggies or users, when they meet Christ, yay. They just hold on to him like this. Because now they have found the, the, the real drug, I'm telling you. <laughs> you have no idea. They have met the real drug. They really get crazy for Christ. Because they really, really, really were searching for meaning in life, but couldn't find it. And now when they find it, it is the most powerful and beautiful experience they will ever have in their life. All I can say is be patient with people. Be patient with people. But even when you're patient with them, be smart. Make sure you, you, you have the key to the house. You know? That you don't come back and they've sold everything. You know? But taking them to a prison, to rehab, it's just going to make it worse. I'm telling you that. But hey, it's... It's your decision. If you feel that taking them to rehab is a solution, that is your choice. I've given you the solution. Christ is the gate. And um, about fornication, this is the last one. Now we all know that fornication is uh, that, that, you know, sex before marriage and, you know, defilement of the body. What I can say about fornication is that it is in the church. Pastors are doing it. Preachers. Trusted people. And let me tell you something. Anyone can do this. And before I, I even go to fornication, let me make this statement. Coming to Christ Coming to Christ is a journey. He can instantly heal you when you surrender. But, but, there is a very big possibility of backsliding and going back to your old life. And you become a druggie again. You become a thief. Yeah, and you become a homosexual. You become whatever you are before a fornicator because Matthew chapter 13 uh, is it 13 or 12 Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45, it says that when an unclean spirit leaves a man, it runs through the dry places in the wilderness, finding rest, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it comes back, it checks on the house where it came, and it finds it well garnished and prepared. Then it runs back to the wilderness and brings seven more sp seven spirits more wicked than itself. And when they enter or when they repossess you, your state will become worse than it was before. So when you decide to walk with Christ, and he delivers you from this drugs alcohol you make sure you do not go back you make sure you cut ties with that world you make sure you cut off the friends that lead you to that let them make fun of you let them say anything painful or hurtful but if you do not cut yourself off if you do not carry your cross if you do not walk away from that life from anything you have to break any tie anything that ties you back to that life to drinking to drugs anything 
I can't remember. I, I can never forget the countless times I got, I got, a, I got cigarettes. I remember I even got a pack and threw it in the toilet and flashed. I don't know how many times I threw away cigarettes. And I'm like, Lord, this is the last time, this is the last time. But I never, the problem was, I really wanted to leave, to stop smoking. But the thing was, I was keeping the company. Well, a time comes when you can interact with people that do these things. But when you are struggling with something, you cannot. You have to consecrate yourself. You have to go to the wilderness. You have to be alone. You have to set yourself apart from the world. When you are seeking God, you have to show him that, Lord, I really mean this by separating yourself completely. So many people do not do that. They really want to see power in Christ. They really want to leave their habits. They want to stop fornicating. They want to stop uh, masturbating. But they still, they still go and watch pornography. They still have text messages from other women or men in their phones. On their WhatsApp, on their Facebook, on their on their social media. They're still talking to people from their past. They haven't moved on. They really they really don't show that they really mean what they say. How is how is that demon really gonna live when you still love it? Fornication is in the church. It is very true. I have seen it. And it's so sad that. It seemed like it was more in the church than in the world. I don't know why I thought that. But the thing is, when you say that fornication is in the church, again, I think of it and I'm like, hey, people that come to church are the sick. These are the people that need help. So when I see those things right now in church, I'm not even shocked because there's a bunch of sick people in church that need fixing, that need the physician, that need Christ. That's why they come to church. But the thing is, they have to be told that, hey, these temptations are going to come. They're going to be there until the day you die. You are going to be tempted. But how are you going to go about this? Because let me tell you, everyone gets tempted. Someone can come from preaching and a very powerful pre- uh, someone or encourage you, uh, hey, oh, the Lord is so amazing, man, God did amazing things for me. Then, as they drive out, someone cuts them off and they flip a finger. They're like, what? You mean Mark flipped a finger? But he was preaching this, you know, you should never trust men. I always tell people that, look at Christianity this way. Where, where I come from, they always told us, hey, I, I remember health, health workers and my parents, they always told me, hey, you are the only one that doesn't have HIV. Everyone around you, you cannot trust them. They are sick. That is the same thing you have to do with Christianity. Guard your salvation with fear and trembling. Know that everyone else you see that claims they are Christian are not Christian until you see their walk. That is the attitude I walk with. Someone can come and say all the beautiful things about Christ. Oh, I saw Christ. I had this. I had this hell. All that. I have seen some of that stuff. And let me tell you, you can still go to hell even after you see Jesus. So I, I, I am looking at this walk f- from a different perspective right now. I will not get so excited when it comes. And I used to be the kind of person, someone says, I'm a Christian. I'm like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. That's so amazing. You know, you get excited. But right now, people say, I'm a Christian. I'm like, okay, that's good for you. And I do not even discredit them, you know. I'm like, okay, 
at the back of my mind, I'm like, hey, I, this person says they're Christian. I have to see it in their walk. Their walk will show me. Because you can't tell me you're a Christian and then you pass, you go on the freeway and you start abusing people. It is true that there are moments where you can get weak, where you can lose it really. But if it's all the time, if it's all the time, then you, my friend, you have something you're struggling with. But the thing is, as long as you're alive, the enemy will never rest. He will never rest. And you see, we are so trusting. This is why all these things happen with fornication. We are so trusting that, you see, a man or a woman can genuinely really want to help someone, you know, or someone of the opposite sex, you know, because people, I've found this so many times. You might find people that want to confine, you'll find a woman more comfortable to speak about a personal life with a man compared to another woman because they have a fear of hey they gossip they do this or that and you'll find men more comfortable to speak to the opposite sex compared to speaking to other men because they feel that hey if this guy finds out my weakness he'll think i'm weak you understand those are deceptions from the enemy and the enemy has gotten people like that because he wants this woman goes, pours out her heart to this man. This man goes, pours out his heart to this person. And the enemy will use the pity, the pity card. Yes, he uses that a lot. And these people always end up getting entangled. Next thing you know, they are together. And this is why Paul was like, hey, do not let the women speak. This is why all these people had these uh, sort of guidelines from the past, that, hey, they not women speak in the public because, you know, they could speak profound stuff. And it takes humbleness, guys, because they could speak, someone could speak profound stuff and you're like, hey, let me go speak to you. Then you start putting them in high regard and you start confining in them. Then the next thing you know, you're getting close, you're getting close and you're gone. Next thing you know, there's a scandal, there's an affair. That's how it starts. And the thing is, people start with a genuine heart that, hey, I just want to help this person. But Paul says, why is this sexual immorality? It's this side, run this side. If it's coming from this side, run that side. You understand? Do not mess with anything. Do not trust yourself. I do not trust myself. I do not trust myself. You know, I can, I can speak to females, but I know my boundaries. I'll keep it an open space. But these things of, hey, let's talk, um, let's meet up here and talk alone. Hey guys, I'm telling you, I am telling you. Me, I have shared the word of God with, with, with some, some females before, some sisters before. And I was genuinely sharing the word. And I remember one of the sisters told me, hey, I wish, I wish you were my man. You know, I wish you're the, you're the kind of man, you know, I would wish to. And I'm like, does she even know what she's wishing for? I am also struggling. And you're wishing for that, you know? And... Women are more vulnerable that if they find a beast of a man, he's going to end up sleeping with them. Not everyone, not every man has, has shame out there, guys. I'm telling you, even people in church. Some of these people, they're still struggling with demons. But they genuinely want to share the word of God. And I feel they are ready to share it with you in private. I'm telling you. You end up seeing scandals and scandals and scandals. Some people, they're genuinely fornicators. They just love it. Some people, they never see it coming. But it gets really heavy and they get tricked in there. And that is the enemy. That is what he wants. So because the enemy has created stereotypes that, hey, men cannot speak to men. 
because it's weak. How can another man see you weak? You know? Women cannot speak to women because women cannot be trusted. That is what I have heard most women, that, hey, women cannot keep a secret. Well, do not say things to people because you want them to be secret. Besides, a secret is something that only you know. If I have a secret, I'll make sure that no one knows. No one. Because even if my, my, my wife knows it or my daughter, then it's no longer a secret. It is something that only you know. So if it is something you do not want anyone to know, do not tell them. Tell it to the Holy Spirit. This is why God is so amazing, that he gave us the Holy Spirit. We can cry to him, we can speak to him, even when the enemy uses all these things around. Today people don't trust, today people are committing suicide because of this same stereotype, because of this same kind of mindset that, hey, men don't cry. They see a man cry, they put him on, on, on social media, the whole world laughs at him, then the guy commits suicide. But imagine if you're grounded in God, that can never happen to you. You understand? You need the Spirit of God so that you will know the right people to share your deep things with. People that will understand. The Bible says in the book of Matthew uh, 7, Matthew 7, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 7, Where is that? 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 Yeah, Matthew 7 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. You should know the people to give your pearls, not swine. Don't just go and give any pig anything because it's going to attack you. Can you go and give? an iPhone to a pig, like a pig, 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 you get an iPhone, Pro 13, and you give it to a pig, and you go, and you go to a, to a pig stand, like, oink, oink, iPhone, that thing is, it's going to poop on that phone, and it's going to step on it, it's going to roll on it in the mire, and then that pig will kick you out of the, of the sty, you understand? When you have the Holy Spirit and you follow by the lead of the Holy Spirit, He's going to lead to the right kind of friends, the right kind of people that are going to edify you, that are going to lift you up, that are going to encourage you, that are going to expound you, people that you are going to share your stories with. And you grow in Christ and you get to know God on a, di on a whole different level, I'm telling you. Do not look at people. God bless you.